And I'm thrilled to talk about this topic, not only because of the negotiation part, but because of the executive compensation um, and all the women who are moving into the executive compensation uh, height all right, and need to be prepared to be negotiating what's there. I'm going to today, as I think most of you know, just managing expectations. I will throw in some negotiating tips as we go along, but in a half hour, I can't possibly cover executive compensation issues, much less the whole field of negotiation. So I think we'll be doing another program for you that's negotiation specific, but you're going to hear some of my tips as we go ahead. And you're also going to have information so you can pick up the phone and call and we can, you know, we can talk through something that you're negotiating that's particularly difficult and we can go from there. So next, all right. And while we're doing that, when I start to talk about negotiation, I want to return to the conversation about what's a good deal? I mean, what are we negotiating? What do we think that we're looking for? And if we were in person, I'd be making you answer the question, right? But we're not. And so I'm going to give you a clue. You're looking for an agreement. Both sides don't have to be thrilled with the agreement, but both sides need to be able to perform. You don't want to have negotiated agreement and then pat yourself on the back for something that's so one-sided that the other side is not only resentful, but simply can't perform. Let's talk about in terms of compensation. What happens if you negotiate compensation because they really need you, which is so far in excess of what other people are, are making that are similar to you, that there's resentment? or that you have to work like triple time because no matter what you do, it's not enough to be earning the compensation that you negotiated, just as an example. So it's not always good to take the last dollar off the table. It's usually good to leave something on the table no matter what you're negotiating. It could be dollars or it could be some other give, some piece of reciprocity. There are many topics we're going to, to be talking about, but we'll just start going through them right now, and I'll give you some tips as we go along the way. The first tip I'm going to give you is you must be prepared. Prepared, prepared, and then prepared again. A discipline. If you're going in to negotiate compensation and you're going to be a fresh executive, all right, this is not a promotional opportunity, that means you have no information non-public information about how this company is doing, what they say they're going to do. Let's say they're going to restructure and make you an executive of a new division. All right. You don't know whether this is a company that keeps their word, that they're really going to create this division for you. You don't know if the company's going to change their mind because they happen a lot of times. And you don't even know what they're paying other people. So what you need to do is be making as many calls as you can to your friends and acquaintances to peer convert to peer corporations, and who is always your best piece of information are competitors. So think in terms of speaking to your banker. They can't disclose non-public information, but their access to public information is a lot more general than yours is. So speak to the stockbrokers and bankers, call Barbara and Nancy and ask if they know anything public about the company you're going to work for, or or the people you're going to work for. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is title. Are you gonna be an EVP, an SVP, a director, a manager of, of what? What is your title going to do? And how is it going to appear on your card? And what does it mean inside the organization? Will you have the authority to negotiate outside the respect based on that title? Will you have the authority to negotiate inside to get the workforce you need, the budget you need, everything that you require in order to succeed in your new job. Title is extremely important and it's worth pushing for. Next, who are you gonna be reporting to? You wanna be reporting to the CEO. Unless you're two levels down, then you wanna make sure you're reporting to somebody who the CEO loves. You wanna not really be reporting to somebody who's about to retire unless, all right, they've told you that you're being hired in a possible succession plan. And that'll, that gets a little too complicated for this conversation, but if that is what's happening, you want some kind of written confirmation of a succession plan and some severance if that doesn't occur. But in any case, reporting, it's important. If you're reporting to well, somebody who's beloved, you're gonna be a shining star. If you're reporting to somebody who's not respected, 
all right, or not doing their job, that means that you're going to have trouble um, meeting your goals. Base bonus. That's money. And we said it's not all about money, but it is about money. Anything you negotiate on the offer is going to stick with you going all the way through the rest of your life with this company. So make certain that you're pushing hard, that you have some sense of what peer corporations are paying for your job. If it's an NEO, a named executive officer of a public company, then you get to see the peer information pretty readily. Otherwise, you're going to have to be calling some friends who do the executive comp work that, uh, you know, and I can recommend you to people who you pay to, to do more than simply go on the net and to get the non-public information for what a base is. But you can also, also just directly ask, what are my peers? Who is my peer? It's part of the negotiation. Is my peer, if I'm a general counsel, is my peer the finance director, the CFO, or is my peer the GC? If I'm a GC, is my peer the CFO, or is my peer somebody lower down the line? And who is going to be reporting to me? Do I have uh, human resources reporting to me? Or do I report directly again to the CEO? Am I on the executive leadership team? All part of the money, because if you have a peer, you can compare salaries and bonus. And bonus, in this case, we're looking at cash at the moment. And that's usually a target bonus. And it's totally discretionary. So realize that you want to be pushing for the largest target that you can because that's going to affect any increase you get in the salary and your base is going to also be um, a multiple then and as a result of the target bonus. But be, you're negotiating for fairness and you're negotiating for similarity between who you are and what you bring and other people at your level. Benefits? Well, benefits are pretty easy today because we don't have a lot of the perks, the parking space, the transportation, the clubs, the meals. There's not a lot of that. If you're sales, you're getting a, an expense budget that you should definitely um, figure out what that's going to be and, and what you're able to use. But mostly we're talking about medical benefits today. And you certainly want to know whether or not you are going to get be 100% uh, be responsible for the benefits you're getting, 60%, 20%. <laughs> Who and what and how is their benefit policy laid out? Mm -hmm. What happens when you leave? How can you take advantage of what's there? And can you negotiate what they're paying you, the amount that you're going to pay in? And are there ways around the fact that they may say to you that the benefit plan is uh, engraved in stone because everybody has to say, have the same plan? That doesn't mean that you can't get a bigger bonus to pay for a different plan. Uh, equity vesting. Two ways to be looking at this. Are we talking about a private equity company? Or are we talking about a corporation? Or are we talking about a small non-public business? Exactly what are we talking about? How do we value the equity if it's public, it's simple? How do we value the equity grant that you're receiving? If it's non-public, you have very little way of valuing. You have the hype that comes along with presentations to new investors. You have the last investment that occurred and at what, at what rate uh, that investment occurred, but you don't really know how much you're getting. And are you asking for a 25% of the company? Are you asking for 2% of the company? You're certainly not asking for a number of shares because those shares will be diluted at a time in the future. So you wanna be making certain you understand equity and equity vesting. Equity vests over four or five years these days, not the old three-year-old time. So the other part of this that you're negotiating on equity vesting is, will that equity be yours? Will it be yours once it's vested? Everybody says, oh, my equity's vested. There are forfeiture and clawback provisions in a lot of contracts, either because you've done something wrong, violated a restrictive covenant, or you've done something right, which is go out and find a better job. And because of that, even your vested equity can be clawed back in some circumstances. So you really want to understand what the equity situation is in your company. And again, you want to learn if it's private equity, what are their plans? Are they really going to hold it? They might really love this business and be acquiring to roll up, which means they're holding for a much longer period of time over which you have no control. So are you prepared to take a big dive in cash 
your cash salary, let's say you're ordinarily making 350, 400, 450, 600, they're not paying that on a cash basis to you unless you're CEO. They're paying 250, 300, sometimes less. So you need to figure out what your annual loss of cash is because they often don't pay a cash bonus in private equity and non-public and family held firms. They might pay out in some form of equity or phantom equity. Phantom equity being a measure of performance. You're going to get a percentage, let's say 1% of the difference between today's value and the value when you leave. But you have to make certain that you understand those formulas, that they're using the same formula for the beginning and the end. Lots to discuss there. Options, you can vest your options, but they're going to expire 90 days after you leave if you're being terminated without cause. All right. They could be, if you're leaving voluntarily, those options could expire the date you leave. They could expire 30 days later, but they will expire. You can negotiate for when they expire, but you're negotiating now when you have an offer, not when you're leaving. You're negotiating now to say, you know, I don't want my options. I want a year to exercise my options as opposed to 30 days. So equity vesting, the other thing you're talking about and negotiating at the very beginning of your offer is that you want, if you are terminated without cause, you want your equity to vest, you want your bonus, and you want your equity bonus for the year of termination. So that if I complete December of 2020 and I think that I've earned my bonus, and it doesn't get paid out in the normal course until March of 2021, if you've not negotiated earlier for some pro rata portion of that 2020 bonus, you're not going to see it. And your equity may not vest because they, they're doing their grants and their equity vesting. Their equity vesting date is usually the date on which they pay out cash bonus, which is after the financial statements are completed and we're into March. So you need to make certain that you're negotiating to get a piece of everything you think you earn. Make whole is the reference to when you decide you have a better job, right? And you leave. You're negotiating now with the person who is hiring you to make you whole for everything that you're leaving behind because your company is not going to go out of their way to pay you for anything that you would get like base or bonus or benefits or equity when you're leaving them. So that when you are voluntarily leaving, you just need to know that it's not coming for the company that you're working for today, unless you've negotiated something special. It's going to be coming from the company with whom you're negotiating on your new employment. I'm saving restrictive covenants and exit. So Barbara, we can do next. Um, huh. Laurel, the one thing I was going to say is while you're taking each of these topics one at a time, it is this ecosystem, right? Oh. So that your title may impact the um, level of bonus or equity you're eligible for or long-term incentive plan. So it it's all relates to one another. It does. And that's why each piece of this is so important because you can actually begin negotiating title and not have to worry about what your, your bonus is. You may not even have to worry, we're about to talk about exit in a couple of slides. You may not even have to worry about a severance package negotiation, Barbara, because that title might have attached to it a policy that says you get a year of base and bonus and benefits. So you're 100% right. They all are interplayed and you're gonna be negotiating them in different order all right, depending on what's going to work for you, for you. But you can't ignore what looks little. So if you think you're going in there to negotiate just base and bonus and you'll be happy with whatever equity they give you, you have to understand that uh, you may at the end of the day have nothing in your pocket, mm -hmm. particularly in a private equity deal. And so I'll try and spend some time there. This is very brief. It's very simple. It's straightforward. It's absolute. There is no point in your negotiating with anyone who doesn't have the authority to make the deal with you. If they're not the signatory authority, if they don't have the authority, the decision-making authority. So HR, frankly, could probably sign, but HR doesn't have its own budget for your job. They have to go to the person you're going to work for or to the CEO, or maybe the HR person who's talking to you is not head of HR. And the HR person who is 
you know, head of all HR of the company could be a very powerful person who the CEO trusts to make all these decisions. You want to be certain that the person you're talking to has the authority to give you what you're asking for. That's simple. And you, you find that out by asking very carefully. If you say, do you have authority to do this deal? They say, yes, because it's the deal they're offering, not the deal you're negotiating. So you have to say, you know, if, if I need, you know, to get pro rata vesting or I want everything to vest on a change of control, do you have the authority to do that? They're going to say, well, it's not going to happen. They'll say, I don't care whether it happens or not, but I just want to talk to the person who might have authority to make that change for me. So that's where we are. And we're at a next. While we're going to next, I'm going to give you a clue as to the one, one of the most powerful negotiating techniques. Are you all ready? That'd be it uncomfortable. <laughs> ready? That was not even 30 seconds. First person to break the silence loses because they give something up. All right. They give, absolutely give something up. You are not going to be the first person to break the silence. I was on the phone the other day when my opposite right, started to use that on me and I was just kind of laughing. So I just started and because we were on the phone. I just started doing my email. Otherwise, I'd probably just excuse myself, go to the bathroom, come back. But otherwise, you could just sit there and you could just look it up. You could say, You're the only one who's uncomfortable with that silence. And just remember, first person to open their mouth loses something. All right. And the one thing I don't want you women to do is bargain against yourself from discomfort. My women often say, oh, well, if you don't want to do that, we can do this. Put out your offer, put out your position, and then that's it until you hear a response. That's one way of using silence. But don't interpret their silence as a no. Interpret it as a yes. You could, if you have to break the silence, you could say, well, if that's okay with you, that's great. Let's proceed to talk about severance. And then you'll get a response. All right, I take silence as a yes, so let's go. Let's keep going. We're wonderful. Exit. You're going to leave. You're going to leave because you want to leave and get another job. You're going to leave because they tell you to leave. Um, and that would be without cause, most likely. You're going to leave because you did something really bad and stole a lot of money. All right. You're going to leave because you retire. You're going to leave because you die. All right. You're going to leave your job sometime. So what do we know? This is very much like a prenuptial agreement. Everybody thinks when I talk about this, they come back and they think I handle divorces. All right, well, I don't do the matrimonial <laughs> kind of divorce, but this is a divorce and the games are the same. And it can be nasty or nice. In matrimonial, it lasts forever. The good part of in an, in an executive departure, it generally doesn't because everybody wants something done. But the exit is a game and it must be negotiated at the inception before you walk down the aisle. And the one thing you're never going to hear coming out of your mouth, even in private, is, but I trust them, Laurel. These are good people. I have checked them out. They are good people. They're going to be my family. So what do we know about divorce? We know that the minute you're leaving, either by their choice or yours, you are not part of that family if the change happens in about 10 seconds. I'm going, and all of a sudden, you're off the family list. Negotiate this at the beginning, no matter how hard they say we don't do agreements, then say, just fine, we'll do a letter, here are my terms, just incorporate this, incorporate this into a letter, and we'll be fine. I'm negotiating for exit. That would be base, bonus, benefits, vesting of equity. I'm negotiating for a relocation package. If I am terminated and I had to relocate my entire family to New York to take this job, I'm going to try and get some relo to get me back to my hometown if that's where I want to go. I'm negotiating for um, vacation. I'm negotiating for anything that's important to me. It's going to go in the separation negotiation provisions and you're negotiating your non-compete. Let's go to next. Hmm. So we know this exists. We know that there are restrictions on your employment. 
non-competition. If you're in California, no non-competition, but definitely non-solicitation of clients and customers and vendors and consultants that you have worked for while you were with the company. And there's a a non-solicitation of employees taking away their best or the people you worked with. Those are usually a year. I see them now as two years for the non-solicitation and and sometimes 18 months or two years for the non-compete. But generally, unless you're CEO, you're you're not talking about something above um, one year for a non-compete. CEO, CFO, general counsel, senior level, public corporation or well, you know, a company that's doing well uh, for executive team might have an 18 month uh, non-compete, but it will also have an 18 month separation pay. So you're negotiating to be certain that the restrictions on your future employment where you can't get a job and work for a competitor, if you can't do that for 12 months, you're not going to accept exit pay for six months. What are you going to do for the other six months? If the restrictions are very, very strong, you might think to yourself, you know what, I'm going to get paid 12 months and I'll just go on the beach. There are people who take that break paid for, but most of us take that extra money, put it in the bank for retirement and invest it with cap strategies. That's what our smart people do. (laughs) So you want to be certain that the restrictions placed on you are equivalent to the benefit of severance that you're getting and negotiate that. But you also want to look at those restrictions. Very few people think that restrictions on your employment, non-compete and non-solicitation, are negotiable, and they are. You just start to pick at them. You pick at the reasonableness as it relates to you. What happens if you are a marketing person and you see only marketing information and you really don't know anything about the finances of the company? You could very well take a job in marketing someplace else. All right, and and not and not hurt them because the marketing restrictions are not are the marketing information you have really doesn't apply to your new job, even though some other portions of the company are competitive. You could work for a division of a larger company. A division of that larger company competes with your current employer, but the division you go to work for does not. You can write that in. You could be talking about going to work for private equity, working for a holding company where one of their their holdings is a competitor, but you're working in another place. So uh, these are all negotiable and they can be all narrowed, but you need to ask about it, push push for it and and tell them the reasons, that's it. And the reason really is about how valuable you are to them, which is what you're talking about the whole time. So confidence as you walk into negotiation is about who you are, what have you done in the past that proves that? And all right, what examples can you give them and what certainty can you provide that you're going to hit that job running and that in no time at all, they're going to have exactly what they expect from you when you set the goals. You also can be negotiating your bonus goals. So it's not the 35% or the 50% target. It's exactly what goal corporate Revenue goal, for instance, are they expecting you to hit before you get that 35% bonus or the 100% bonus? So their revenue target could well be outlandish. So you need to negotiate that down or get a guaranteed bonus. If you're only in the last quarter of the year, you might say, hey, I want to know that um, I'm going to get 25% of my bonus at the end of this year because you're not going to have any way of judging my performance before that. And by the way, Who makes your performance decisions and evaluates you is also extremely important. And you're going to need to know that before walking in. And I think that we are on uh, the restrictions negotiable. Let's go to the next. I did have a couple of questions I wanted to ask uh, that have come in. So one is, um, you know, how, and you talked about this before about whether you negotiate in writing or verbally. Um, So I want you to address that. But then this also says, how common or can you negotiate in writing what your next promotion will be, um, assuming performance is on target? For example, signing on as an EVP with significant responsibility, how do you get them to go just beyond the verbal that there is upward mobility and, and, and you know in an appropriate time frame. So there are about three or four questions in that one question. Let me see if I can hit at them. The first thing is, as far as title, initially, you are uh, 
requiring that they put your title in writing as part of a written offer. You're basically saying it's an offer letter. It doesn't have to be a 90 page agreement, but it has to have all the components that we talked about as a promise to pay if you come. If part of that promise is that you are being brought in to succeed somebody, CFO is going to be retiring in two years. We're bringing you in as deputy CFO and we're paying you this, but in two years you will be CFO. You want that down in writing, or you want to be able to say, if you do not advance me, because if you're sitting on the employer side, you're saying, why do I want to make that you know, promise when somebody's going to come in and they just may not be everything they're cracked up to be. It just, they may not work well with the people here. They may not get the company culture, whatever the reasons are. Uh, you, as an, sitting as an employer, I'm not going to be so eager all right, to put the fact that I promise you a succeeding position, but uh, negotiating on behalf of the executive, what I would say is, if you're coming and you're relying on that promise to come to me, then I want to see it in writing. And if I don't get it, if you have to make another decision, then I want a severance package. I don't want you to demote me to something else, keep me in the secondary position. It's not why I came. So I want a severance package, an exit package that covers. Um, base, bonus, benefits at a level that gives me the opportunity to look for a new job. So it's almost, for those of you who knows, it's almost like a good reason clause that says, if you don't promote me to this position within two years or at the moment that this person retires, then I am able to choose to leave or to choose to accept another job that you're offering. That's um, also, you also have to watch out that the people who say they're retiring might choose not to retire. COVID comes in, the person who's going to retire says, ouch, I need to work two or three more years. So you might be in a five-year position. So you either could, you can time it or you, you know, by saying, if you don't, if I don't get it in two years, or you can basically say, if I don't, you know, receive the promotion when he, when he or she, he generally, right. Uh, when he or she leaves. Um, and then how hard is it? To oh. no, go ahead. I wanted to ask how hard it is to negotiate when you're getting a promotion. So you're already in there. Um, you might be junior for that band relative to pay. Um, how do you try to secure real improvements? I hear people say, oh, I got a promotion. I'm like, oh, did you get more money? No. No. Did you get a title? I love no. this question. I love this question. But before I answer it, I'm going to go to the other question that you asked that I forgot about. Very, very simple. Do I negotiate in writing? I assume what you're saying is, do I trade letters and emails to negotiate my deal? For me, that's the easiest question in the world to answer. The answer is no, you do not negotiate by email or in writing. Uh, you can confirm what you understand after having spoken to somebody because it may not be personal today. So you just write a confirming note that it's my understanding that we agree to A, B, C, and D. And, and so let me know if there's any changes and they come back. That's fine. That's not the final agreement, but it's just a sign off. Where are we in this deal so that you can go from there forward? But if you're negotiating by email, it is so easy for me to say, no, thank you. All right. Just stick with the deal. I just stick with the deal. I sent you. No, we're not negotiating. Very simple. And you don't want that. But so Barbara, remind me, give me one word to remind what I was going to answer your question. So, uh, and a promotion. Well, first of uh, all, promotion. very tough, very tough. But very doable. The guy gets a promotion. He walks into his boss's office, his new boss or the boss that gave him the promotion, and he says, You're fabulous. Thank you. I certainly earned it, right? And I'm glad I did it with you and with your help. But now that I'm here, I really would like that office over there because it's closer to my team. I want to make certain that that title comes with the extra you know, usual grant that I will be, you know, part of the executive retirement plan and that I will receive an extra special sign-on grant right now for um, a thank you for the promotion. All right, there is no woman on the planet. Well, I know of two, all right, on the planet, all right, who actually walk in and do that. And there are reasons for that. One is correct and the other is not. The first reason is that you don't, you're uncomfortable about asking for it. You're not sure that you're, that you're worthy of that particular job. You bet that if they gave you the job, they know you can do it. You could ask for a promotion upon the achievement of some very specific objective. If I sell X, I would like Y. That's fine. 
But if you just take what they're offering, they're going to say, nobody else asked for anything. I just gave you a promotion. You're saying, yes, you're giving me a title. So I want to make certain that any severance package I get is based on that title. I want to make certain that my new bonus is, um, you know, if it's a target percentage that it's raised, I want to make sure that my base is raised. I mean, you're getting a position that's that needs to be even with your peers, even if you are less experienced, if they're there 15 years and they're, you're there half a year, yes, there's going to be a difference. But you can just say, I would like to know exactly how long it's going to take me to get to so-and-so's position. All right. And what authority do I have? Again, you're back to the same negotiating technique. Just say, okay, you know, so what's my budget? What's my P&L going to look like? You know, what, what do I have to, um, to be hiring my own team? You know, do I have some ability to hire and fire? So there's lots of things other than money that you're going to negotiate on a promotion. But money is a part of it. And if you steer completely away, you could make it personal, which I don't love because it takes it puts a little bit of that manipulative woman part in here. But you might say, hey, I've got two kids going off to college next year. And I could really, you know, use I, I could really use some help here. And it would be great if we could increase my salary this much here and this much there and get approval for it right now so I know how to budget for college. It's not wrong. I just love to see you shine on the value of your performance, but use whatever you can to make certain that at that moment, just like at the moment of the first offer, at that moment, you're setting the stage for wherever you're going to go from there and what salary you're going to get from that point forward. So, Laurel, 30 seconds on knowing when to walk, because I left that, and then I'll just wrap it up here. Okay, so knowing when to walk is simple. If you've got a better deal, you walk. If you think you're going to get a better deal in the future, you're walking. If you're getting everything you think you like, but there's something that's making you extremely uncomfortable, follow your gut and, and walk. All right. You may starve for a couple of extra months, uh, but you're not going to put an offer into your resume, a new position, and then leave it in three months or six months and leave yourself with a hole. Don't use knowing when to walk as a negotiating tip unless you're absolutely certain that you would walk. So don't don't say to somebody, I'm out of here. This is just not enough. Thinking that when you walk out that door. They're going to say, whoa, Laurel, come back. We didn't mean that. Here's extra money. They might very well do that. It is a negotiation skill tip, but you have to be ready to execute that walk if they don't want you back. But mostly, is there a better alternative than the job that they're handing you? And if you believe that there is, then you're going to walk. That's simple. Don't make it into a really big decision. Go work for Starbucks and get some benefit in the meantime, right? So you have got a couple of bullets that I have put out for you and Barbara and Nancy are going to send this to you because we haven't talked about all kinds of negotiation techniques, but I'm going to pick out two. One we talked about, you notice that prepare comes in threes. If I were really talking to you, it would probably come in tens. If you don't make 10 phone calls to prepare yourself for some negotiation, more would be nice. Uh, you're not prepared. You don't know the status of the company, even, even the status of the division that you're in. You don't know whether they're having financial difficulties. So to ask for too much is really ridiculous. You could do some future ask you to talk about phantom equity instead of equity. If it's a privately held company, you need to know if this is a family held operation and what the culture is and whether they are difficult to deal with, you know, difficult to please. All of that comes from prepare, prepare, prepare. Who's on the other side of the table? How do they negotiate? Are they, scream are they screamers? But the big one I want to spend time on is listen. We don't listen. We hear the words and we think about what we're going to say back as a response. That you read about all the time. I would spend with you a half an hour on listening techniques. That's how important it is to actually focus on precisely what words your opposite side is using to describe the job, to describe the person they would like to hire, to, to describe the culture of the company, to, to describe their goals for the company. You're going to be able to tell whether these are legitimate goals or stretch goals, whether they think you can get there or not, whether they really believe you're the person for the job long term or whether you're a gap filler. When you ask about the fact that um, 
You hear they want to make a significant change and how you're going to be the scapegoat by the people who don't want the change. And you start to discuss, you listen to their answer to say, to hear whether there is a group that will be opposing you that has power and might end up terminating you. So you want to listen to the words, the spaces, the hands. You don't have to be an expert at um, body language, but you can pretty well tell the speed of what they're talking, the manner in which they talk. Everything about what they're saying is going to be important to you when you're thinking and putting a space between the end of their sentence and the beginning of your response. You have time to think about the response. And if it requires a very long response, a very thoughtful response, there is nothing in the world that stops you from saying, give me a day, I'll get back. I want to think about that. It's a very, very important question with lots of details in that answer. Now, I'd like to give you a full answer. So I'll give you a call tomorrow and we can talk about that. But meanwhile, how about this? And then you're in listening mode again. If you can get them to talk about themselves, the job, the other people in the job, you know, instead of boasting about you, that would be incredible. That kind of listening is a real skill. They have your resume. They have interviewed you. They know about you. But putting, making certain that they understand that you listen to what they're saying and you have interest in them and the job to continue to ask questions and actually are putting their answers together because you heard them. Very impressive, very difficult, very effective. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Well, Laurel, we're, I feel like clapping, right? So we're all listening, listening well to you. Thank you for helping us gain a broader perspective on the different aspects of an employment negotiation beyond just the money. There's so much to think about. And you did share a lot about the what, but so much about the how you really offered some insights. And I know that we want to do another session more on the whole art of negotiation. So for another day. We will do that. We'll make make our women the very best negotiators they can possibly be. And we'll take away their fear or discomfort in negotiation. Right. Um, You know, and, and the one thing that all of this is predicated on is that we have to ask, right? There's so many studies that show that women don't ask, that we don't self-advocate. As Nancy talked about the importance in the beginning, Laurel reference, we have to ask for what we want and what we deserve. And there certainly is a lot of lack of self-confidence at times with the ask for men and women in negotiating, but often more so for women. So uh, whatever we can do in Laurel to be a resource to help you remove that obstacle from your success, we hope we've shed some light on it today and we're committed to offering another session